Note, when I say pressure field or pressure function in this video, I really mean pressure disturbance function, which is defined as follows. If the cavity contained no sound, the pressure would be uniform, that is, a constant everywhere. The pressure disturbance function describes the deviation of the pressure from this constant due to sound. It is important to note that both the pressure and the pressure disturbance functions solve the wave equation, because they differ by only a constant. The constant difference also has no effect on the incompressibly uniform Euler's equations, which will be employed to obtain the boundary condition because they only include the gradient of the pressure. In this video, we're going to calculate the harmonic frequencies and associated pressure functions of a spherical cavity. To do this, we'll obviously be solving the wave equation, where P is the pressure and V is the speed of sound in the fluid in the spherical cavity, but the raw wave equation isn't all we need. We also need to select a coordinate system that makes the problem handleable, and we need a mathematical way of putting a sound in a spherical cavity. By this, I mean the following. The wave equation on its own describes free sound waves, but we're not interested in free sound waves. We're interested in calculating a particular characteristic of sound waves confined to a spherical cavity. Namely, we're interested in calculating at what frequencies the cavity will resonate and how the pressure will be distributed. So we need some mathematical way of enforcing the effect that the cavity walls would have on the sound waves in a problem that otherwise would be free. Let's handle the first of those two problems first namely a coordinate system selection. The obvious choice, given the spherical symmetry of the problem, is spherical coordinates centered at the center of the spherical cavity. The reason why this is a good guess is the following. First of all, we know the wave equation will be separable in spherical coordinates, and second, whatever other constraints we do have to impose to enforce the effect of the boundaries will be at constant radius. Therefore, we stand a good chance of having simpler, easier to deal with mathematical constraints by selecting spherical coordinates. Now on to the second and more difficult of those two problems. How exactly do the cavity walls change the problem mathematically? Thinking about this carefully, we know that the dominant effect of the cavity walls will be to make the perpendicular displacement of the fluid carrying the sound zero at the boundary for all time. This means that the radial velocity component will also be zero at the boundary for all time because they are related by a time derivative. We also expect that in any physically reasonable situation, the fluid carrying the sound will be of uniform density and virtually incompressible relative to the sound pressure involved. This is important because that means we can use the incompressible uniform density Euler equations to relate velocity and pressure. Because it's the pressure that we're solving the wave equation for, but the direct effect of the cavity walls is on fluid velocity, such a relationship will allow us to extract a constraint on the pressure function at the boundary that mathematically accounts for the effect of the cavity walls in terms of the pressure function. So let's get going with this. These are the incompressible uniform density Euler equations. Given that value for del w, you can start to see how this equation really will help us relate pressure and velocity. But of course we need to work this down a little bit before we actually get the boundary condition we're looking for. The first step is to recognize that there is no body acceleration in this problem, so g vector equals zero. We can also insert that value for grad w directly into the equation, giving us this. Now if we take the gradient in spherical coordinates, then we get this three vector equation. From here we can see that if we insert the fact that the radial component of the velocity is zero into the radial equation, it boils down into this boundary condition. This is the condition that we need to enforce on our general solution in order to make sure that it reflects the presence of the cavity. Beyond the wave equation itself and this boundary condition, there are two other physical constraints that our solution obviously must satisfy. It must have no divergences and it also must be continuous. These are basic conditions the solution must satisfy in order to count as a physical solution, and they seem pretty obvious, but they're still worth stating because they're going to be used in the math. And with these last constraints, we have finally finished setting up the problem. With the setup finally done, we can get to actually solving the problem now. The basic process is to use separation of variables to solve the wave equation for its general physical solution. Then we can impose the boundary conditions to restrict the solution set down to just the the harmonic solutions, and from this we'll get the harmonic frequencies. In general, when you first solve ordinary differential equations in a physics problem like this that are yielded by separation of 
variables, you get a set of solutions that includes a variety of unphysical solutions, which you have to eliminate via physicality constraints in order to get what I just called the general physical solution. And as I said, it's that that you impose your boundary conditions on. When solving a partial differential equation involving both spatial variables and a time variable, my habit is to separate the time from the space first and then separate apart all the spatial variables afterwards. Therefore, this is our separation ansatz. If we insert that into the wave equation and divide, we arrive at this equation. Both sides of the equation depend only on variables that the other side of the equation does not depend on. So the two sides of the equation aren't just equal to each other, but they're specifically equal to a constant. And with this, we've obtained two equations, an ordinary differential equation for the time factor, and a three-variable pure spatial partial differential equation for the spatial factor. The ordinary differential equation for the time factor is of the form of a simple harmonic oscillator, and it's solved by sines and cosines, as usual. However, to solve the spatial equation, we're going to have to continue with separation of variables. Perhaps because I'm used to solving quantum mechanics problems, my habit is to next separate the radial variable from the angular variables. So our ansatz looks like this, inserting the ansatz into the equation and then dividing by the ansatz, as well as multiplying by r squared, leaves us with this equation. We can then subtract all the terms that depend purely on angular variables over to the other side of the equation. We again have a situation where both sides of the equation depend only on variables that the other side of the equation does not depend on. Therefore, again, both sides of the equation are not only equal to each other, but are also equal to a constant. However, here we want to select the form of this constant very specifically. We want to select it to be L times L plus 1 because that causes the angular equation to take on a familiar form which will help us save a lot of time. Yet again this gives us two equations, an ordinary differential equation for the radial factor and a two variable partial differential equation for the angular factor. Now, under normal circumstances, we then have to separate the angular variables, which you definitely can do, and then solve those ordinary differential equations, but it turns out this particular two-variable angular partial differential equation is an extremely famous one, and as a result, we already know the physical solutions to it, so we can skip that process. Specifically, this equation is the equation satisfied by the spherical harmonics. The spherical harmonics are the complete set of physical solutions to this equation, meaning ones that are both continuous and non-divergent. This is the first case where we need those extra constraints that I mentioned at the end of the setup of this problem. Using the normalization convention that's common in acoustics, the spherical harmonics are given by this formula, where L is an integer and M is also an integer, specifically one that's greater than or equal to negative L and less than or equal to positive L. Now obviously the spherical harmonics are complex given the azimuthal phase. To get the physical pressure functions, you can take either the real part or the imaginary part, depending on your phase conventions. Because sine and cosine differ only by a 90 degree phase difference. For this video, I arbitrarily chose the real part. All we have to do now is solve the radial equation and impose the boundary condition and we'll have our answer. Solving the radial equation is pretty straightforward. The first step is to subtract the constant term over to the other side of the equation so that the equation is in the format of something set equal to zero. Then we can multiply the whole equation by rho and factor rho out of the last two terms. Next, we can evaluate the outer radial derivative using the product rule. We can then make the problem easier by switching to the scaled variable x equals kr. This last step leaves us with the familiar spherical bezel equation, which is a nice surprise because that's an equation that's already been solved. We know that its general solution for integer l is the set of standard spherical bezel functions and spherical Neumann functions given by the on-screen formulas. You can consider the spherical bezel equation spherical bezel bezel functions and spherical Neumann functions for the case of non-integer L, in which case you'd need more general formulas than what I've listed here. However, that's completely unnecessary because imposing physicality constraints on the angular part of the solution has already restricted L to be an integer. By looking at the formulas that give the spherical bezel functions and spherical Neumann functions for the case of integer L, we can see that the spherical Neumann
Neumann functions have a divergence at x equals zero. They therefore violate the no divergences physicality condition that we stated at the end of the introduction, even for integer l. This leaves us with the set of spherical bezel functions as the physical general solution to the radial equation. With our physical general radial solution in hand, we can switch back to the original radial variable, leaving us with this. We're finally now ready to impose our boundary condition. If we define x l n to be the nth zero of the derivative of the lth spherical bezel function, we can see that the boundary condition is satisfied if we take k to be equal to x l n over the radius of the cavity. This immediately gives us the resonant frequencies. Here is how. We know that the frequency is equal to the angular frequency over 2 pi, and when we look back at the time factor solution that we found at the beginning of the separation of variables process, we see that omega equals kv, and we only just learned from imposing the boundary condition on the radial factor that k equals x l n over the radius of the cavity, which upon insertion into the frequency formula leaves us with our final result for the resonance frequencies. With the resonance frequencies determined, all we need to do now is construct the associated pressure functions. The first step is to explicitly write out the complete physical general solution that we've already calculated via separation of variables. To reduce the physical general solution to the subset of pressure functions associated with the harmonic frequencies, all we have to do is insert the discretized value of k that gave us those harmonic frequencies, leaving us with this set of pressure functions. And the general solution for noise in a cavity like that would be an arbitrary superposition of the various harmonic modes. So a formula like this. In case you don't know, the constant a there is basically just an amplitude and it's a function of what's driving the system. I hope you enjoyed this video or at least found it interesting. If you did, please consider sharing it with a friend, giving it a thumbs up, and subscribing.